Dr. Robert McKee, a USC professor who literally wrote the book on storytelling, once said, storytelling is the most powerful way to put ideas into the world. Every day, each of us tells stories to our kids, our teams, our bus drivers. Through stories, we are constantly, constantly sharing bits of who we are, what we believe, and what we aspire to. And in fact, storytelling is ever present. And in the words of the great Margaret Atwood, you're never gonna kill storytelling because it's built into the human plan. Well, if we're stuck with it, we may as well start using it our nonprofits, eh? And who better to share how to do this than our next speaker, Vanessa Chase Lakshin. Vanessa is the author of the book, The Storytelling Nonprofit. Now a nonprofit consultant, she founded an agency that shares the same name, The Storytelling Nonprofit, which helps nonprofits articulate their impact to donors using narrative techniques, techniques to generate greater personal interest, accountability, and ultimately helping organizations improve their fundraising success. Vanessa is the co-founder of the Stewardship School and a board chair at Women Against Violence Against Women. Vanessa, welcome to Capacity. Thank you so much for being here. Maybe. OK. Yeah. Have fun with it. Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. <laughs> Good morning. How's everyone doing? Yeah? Great. Oh, perfect. Got all the pieces now. Oh, it's Friday morning. Um, I don't know about a lot of you, but I am still feeling a little sleepy. So let's stand up. Let's do a stretch. All right. Let's stretch out the arms, shall we? Overhead, maybe across chest. Excellent. Shake out the legs. Great. All right. Give someone next to you a high five. Let's sit back down. <laughs> Excellent. All right. All right. <laughs> Great. So I am really excited to be here today to talk about storytelling. In my wheelhouse of consulting, it's one of my favorite things to do and work on. Um, I always think about myself as being a professional problem solver. You know, in fundraising and in communications, we're constantly trying to solve problems, right? Whether it's to raise more money, whether it's to broaden our reach, there's lots of kind of large problems that we're solving in these different areas of our organizations. And one of the things that I like to do is drill down a little bit more and think about, well, what am I really solving for? Yes, I might be trying to raise more money, but I find oftentimes in fundraising, one of the things I'm really trying to solve for is how to better connect with my donors, how to better connect with them through messaging, through story. And that's a problem I feel like I'm perpetually solving for every organization we work with. But it's a great problem to solve because I think when you crack the nut on messaging, you're often poised to be able to really connect with people in a meaningful way, build substantial community, and ultimately be able to raise the money and reach the goals that you have for your organization. All of those things are very exciting. All right, so question for all of you. I'm just gonna read it here. So I wanna know, how certain are you that a story or an appeal is going to resonate with your audience? So how many of you are in the like 80 to 100% sure? Any hands? Oh, excellent. What makes some of you so sure about that? Yes? Great. Okay. Okay, great. So body language, looking at past behavior, those things are all great. How many of you are like 50-50? It may work, it may not. <laughs> yeah, quite a few of us, right? Why do you feel that way? Anyone want to share? Right, so you just said everyone's different and you're not sure if something will work for everyone, even if it just works for one person. I think that's true. Um, I think we also, and yes, and I think there's this tendency sometime in fundraising and communications to think that every single person we're communicating with is different. And in fact, I often think there's quite a few kind of similarities, and we'll talk about how to identify some of those today. And how many of you are just like, 
It's a crapshoot. I have no idea if it's going to work. Some of you, yeah, brave souls. I felt that way for a long time as well, where it's just like, is this really going to work? Is it going to fly? Am I just kind of like throwing stuff at the ceiling and seeing what's going to stick? Who knows, right? It's not a great place to be sometimes or a great feeling to have when you're just like, I poured so much time and resources and energy into something. And I don't really know if it's actually going to work for our organization. And so that's one of the reasons why I often think it's really great to think about what can we do to increase the likelihood that something is going to really stick with our audience in terms of messaging and storytelling. Uh, because as I said, we spend so much time and resources on stories, on appeals, and it's so important to make sure that we hopefully have some good success with that. The other thing I always think about too is resonance is really part of our goal, right? It's part of getting our audience to take action, whether it's making a donation, um, sharing something, signing a petition, whatever that goal is. In order to get to that goal, there is some amount of resonance happening. Someone has said, I understand that message. I, I get it. It connects with me in some way. And they felt compelled to take that next step, that next action. Both great things, right? So I want to talk a little bit more about kind of the challenges of resonance, right? Because sometimes, as organizations, we think we know what's up. We think we know exactly what's going to resonate with people. I've had hunches and inclinations where I'm like, I definitely think that's going to be the right thing. And then I'm completely wrong. And I always think about the cat that I live with, who has a thousand places to sit in our house. <laughs> she could sit on couches, on rugs, in her cat bed. She likes to sleep in my slipper, <laughs> which is really kind of random, right? But it's what works for her. It's what resonates with her. And sometimes this is the thing we have to think about with our donor audience, which is sometimes they're going to tell us through their behavior what actually works for them. And this is where it's really important for us to pay attention to the data, to really look for the clues, in addition to being proactive, to think about what is that perfect fit for our audience? How can we achieve it? How can it be like the slipper for my cat, right? <laughs> um, so these are really important things for us to think about as we pull together what are those right messages, what are those right things that we want to say. Um, and as I said, you know, both we as an organization can outwardly think about what that is. Sometimes we're accurate. Sometimes we have enough data and information to be really certain that we're accurate on that. Other times we also just have to put things out and see how people respond and look at the behavioral data that comes with that. All right, so let's talk a little bit about resonance. So I always think that resonance is really about um, deeply connecting with your audience. And I always think about it as being really about connecting at a values or emotions level, sometimes a life experience level too. Um, and I say that because I think that philanthropy for most donors is often really motivated by values, right? They give from a place of values. People connect into your nonprofit's community from a place of values. And when we can reverberate or really resonate with them on a values level, on an emotional level, I think that's when we're really most likely to deeply connect with people. Um, I'm curious, what are some values that you think bring people into your organization's sphere of influence? Anyone want to share? You guys are quiet now. <laughs> yes? Equality. Did you say equality? Equality, equality. okay. Equality like the right people. Great, yeah, equality is a really good example. What else? Safety. Mm hmm Yeah. What else? Other ones. There's I'm sorry? Environment. Environment, yes, that's a great one. Other examples. Gratitude. Gratitude. Tell me more about that. Well, uh, you So a sense of wanting to give back into the community. Yeah, I, uh, absolutely. Gratitude can definitely be a motivating factor for giving. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, so lots of examples. I'd encourage you to think about what are those values that people plug into with your organization. You might be able to really obviously identify them based on your work, which is great. And I would say that's generally the case. People are coming to you for that reason. There might be other ones that you're not thinking about. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how we can start to identify those because they are so powerful for us to really think about. Um, 
like I said, I think the other piece about resonance is that sometimes it can be a little elusive, right? <laughs> We're trying to figure out what it is that will really resonate with people so that we can develop a strong fundraising program, a strong brand. We can have this loyal following of people that love our nonprofit. Um, and I think, as I said before, with my example with the cats, sometimes it can be really easy to take a top-down approach to it, right? Where we as the organization make all the decisions and we say, this is what I think is going to work, this is what we need to do, and we're really sort of excluding our audience in the process. And I always encourage people to really think about taking an inclusive approach to communications and fundraising and think about what is it we can do to really include the donor's perspective in this? What can we do to include the audience's perspective in this so that they get it, they understand it, they like what we have to say, and they feel like they're really heard in this process? These are all important things to think about. Um, I'm also curious, what are some things, just generally, that have resonated with you? It could be nonprofit related, it could be something else. What are some times and examples of things that have resonated for you? Hmm, okay. Yeah, so a simple call to action you can follow through on. It's a great example. What else? Okay, tell me more about that. Why does that resonate with you? Great, great. Impact. Oh, impact. Impact resonates with you. That's great. So seeing the impact and measuring impact. Oh, great. I saw one more hand over there. Love. That's great. <laughs> Those are really great examples. Now, I want you to think about, in your organizations, can you think of times where something has really resonated with your audience? Do you have any inclination as to what that might be? Let's take a second to think about that. Has there been something that's really resonated? And I believe this is the first question on the worksheet, if you would like to jot it down in a specific place. Um, I'll tell, I should give you a personal example, a non-nonprofit example, and then I'll give you a nonprofit example. Um, as I was thinking about this, I think one of the things that really resonated with me in a pop culture setting recently was I saw the movie Lady Bird. How many of you saw that when it's been out? Yes, lots of you, great. You'll know what I'm talking about then. So I grew up outside of Sacramento, um, and which is where the movie is filmed and based. And I saw that movie, and as I was watching the opening scene where there's this mother-daughter exchange, and the daughter is talking about how she must go to New York City because it's the center of arts and culture, and she has to live there as an adult, I remember having that exact same conversation with my mother <laughs> when I was about 16 and telling her I had to move to a larger city. I had to get out of California. And so watching that movie felt very much like watching parts of my childhood anyways. It was very funny. Um, but in a nonprofit context, um, one of the things that I saw probably, gosh, back in like 2011, it's been a while ago now, um, was, I think it was the BC Ride to Conquer Cancer's thank you video for people who had ridden the ride that year from Vancouver to Seattle. It was one of the most, I feel like, emotionally resonant videos I have personally ever seen and that really like, touched me in a really deep way. Um, and just watching the authenticity of the people talk about why they had to do this ride, why it was so important for them. I finished watching it and I had zero interest in actually doing long distance road biking, but I was just like, I need to sign up for this. These people are doing great things. They're so passionate about it. And it was such a learning moment for me, I think also as a fundraiser at the time, to think about, wow, how can I also create that for my audience? How can I have them have these great, igniting moments of excitement about what we're doing and feeling really fired up about those things? Um, so did any of you write down some examples of things that you feel like have resonated with your folks in the past? Would anyone like to share? Also okay if you don't. Oh, yes, I see a hand over there. Um, no. Thanks. Uh, hearing and understanding hopelessness mm. and addressing it with empowerment, belief, and action. That's great. I love that. What else? Anyone else? <coughs> okay. Great example. I have some other ones to share with you too, but let's carry on. So I wanna talk about actually measuring resonance because I think this is part of the trick, right? 
Um, one of the questions I get asked quite often about storytelling is how do I actually measure the effectiveness of the story? How do I know if it worked? How do I know if it was the deciding factor in an appeal that made something more successful? Well, there's lots of ways to test this. Um, but I always encourage people to look at metrics and think about metrics over time. Are you seeing changes in response rates? Are you seeing changes in open rates in email? Um, we have a very a client who has an extremely large email list of almost 5 million people, and they actually calculate something called a resonance rate because for them it's statistically significant. Um, and they actually try to calculate how well they think something resonated based on open rates, click-throughs, and a few other metrics. It's a little complicated. I won't explain that today. But I do think there's simpler metrics that you can use to really look at resonance with people. I often think about it as being donation rates and response rates as being one of the things that I usually look at in fundraising. Um, but there's also other things that you can look at in communications, right? You could look at um, the number of people who have shared something, the number of people who have um, commented on something or engaged with something on social media. There's lots of different metrics that you can look at. And part of it is really just um, a function of starting to pay attention to those metrics so you can pay attention to people's behavior over a period of time. Um, I'd be curious, what are some metrics that some of you look at pretty regularly in fundraising or communications? Great, yeah, so um, you just mentioned frequency of donation rates and also looking at uh, lifts or increases in giving over time, which I think are both really great ones. What else, any others? Yes. Yeah, click-through rates. I think that's a really excellent, sometimes underutilized metric. <laughs> it tells us a lot, right? If someone's taking the time to click through on something after they've opened the email, it's probably resonating or interesting to them on some level. Yes. Oh, unsubscribe. That's an interesting one. Why do you say that? How many of you are really afraid of unsubscribes on your email list? Yeah, <laughs> I see quite a few hands. <laughs> um, so I'll tell you two things I've learned about email lists and unsubscribes over the last few years. Um, one of them is that I have always seen spikes in unsubscribe rates from nonprofits who do not email enough. So if you're emailing less than once a month, like if you're sending a quarterly newsletter, people probably forgot that they are on your list. And they're like, who is this person and why are they emailing me? And you'll generally see a higher spike in unsubscribes than if you're emailing people once or twice a month and they see it and they're used to seeing it in their inbox. Um, and it was really interesting. I had a client in December who we ran, I think, a fairly aggressive fundraising campaign for them. We sent something like seven emails over the month. Um, and they were really nervous about it <laughs> because they had never sent more than, I think, one email in a month. And so this felt like a really big increase in the number of emails that they were sending. And we were doing kind of a after action debrief in, earlier in the month. And I asked them, I was like, so what was the outcome on this? Did we see huge unsubscribes when we started to send more emails like in the last three days of December? And they were like, oh. We didn't even look. And I was like, okay, well, let's check. Like, how many, how many were there actually? And they were like, oh, we only had two unsubscribes. And I was like, exactly. People did not leave your list. They did not start fleeing, which is the good news. So if you've been a little afraid of sending email, I want to say you can probably send more than you're sending right now, and it'll be fine. Um, so thank you for bringing that up, Kyle. <laughs> but the other thing I'll say, too, is that um, for people who do unsubscribe from your list, it's okay. They're probably not going to be people who long-term will make donations or su um, substantially care about what's going on. It's okay that those people are not in your community anymore. There are other people that you can find to bring in. There's infinite amounts of people who can come onto that email list, who you can cultivate, who you can build relationships with. And if over some period of time some of those folks disappear, it's okay. There'll be new people, and new people are great on your list. All right. so. Um, what I want to talk about, though, is when we send things out, switching gears a little bit, I always talk about kind of the, like, what the French toast moment when we send things out and we have zero response, right? We send things out that we're like, oh, I think this is going to be good, 
And then nothing happens. You're like, no one responded to that. <laughs> the story didn't work. The appeal didn't go over so well, whatever that was, right? Um, and I think as fundraisers, as nonprofit professionals, we have a moment where it's just like, what happened? What went wrong with this? And I think it's so important to think about what we learned in those instances. What was it about it that our audience didn't respond to? Did we change something radically? Did we do something different? What happened in that instance? And I would really encourage you, I think that's the second question on the worksheet, to think about um, an appeal or communication, just looking over your shoulder, <laughs> that did not work very well for you. What did you learn from that? What were some learning takeaways that you had from that experiment or that appeal or communication? Jot some of those down. Let's take a second to do that. I have a few more things to say about this. So getting zero response is never a good thing, right? It's often a little jarring for us as organizations. And I think on the flip side, it's also not great for the donors, right? They're like, what is this? Why am I getting this thing? <laughs> and I'll tell you a good example. Um, is anyone here working at UBC in development? If you are, it's okay. I'm just going to talk about it for a second. Um, so I used to work in development at UBC. That was one of my first fundraising jobs. And I'm also an alumni of the university. And I give, um, a usually every year, but unlike most alumni donors who typically give to their faculty or their degree program, scholarship funds, kind of a natural fit for them based on what they did at university, I don't give to the Faculty of Arts. I always give to, um, I make a gift in honor of my mom, who has multiple sclerosis, to an MS research fund at UBC. That's always what I donate to. And the last three or four appeals I have gotten have been for the Arts Faculty of Arts Scholarship Foundation or Scholarship Fund. And I always read it and I'm just like, but why am I getting this? <laughs> it's never been what I've donated to. And I think this is a good example of me being an outlier in the data, but it's also a good example of looking at your donor behavior or audience behavior. What is it that they're responding to? What are they saying yes to? How are they giving? What are they giving to? And how can you start to tailor what you're doing a little bit more to that audience? I can say very definitively, if I got an appeal for MS research, it would one, make a ton of sense to me, and two, be something I'd probably be very quick to donate to because it's what I've given to in the past. Um, but receiving something that isn't necessarily what I've donated to before felt a little jarring and a little like, why am I getting this, right? Um, I wanna ask all of you though, from things that maybe you've written down, what have been some learning outcomes for you from appeals or communications that have not worked out quite as well? Would anyone like to share? Yes, there's a microphone uh, coming, hold on. <laughs> uh, Giving Tuesday. Oh. What about that? Never works for us, <laughs> never. <laughs> and I don't know if it's the competition of that time frame. We're a pretty small nonprofit, so I've researched that a lot of the benefits are the larger nonprofits that sort of benefit from that. Mm -hmm. So, but I mean, I think I got maybe two or three oh. <laughs> donations <laughs> out of that email campaign. So. And are there other times of the year when people do give? Um, Christmas mm -hmm. is our big kind of yeah. push, but yeah. It was trying to engage like non-donors as well to sort okay. of introduce them to donating and it didn't work, mm -hmm. so. Anyway. It's good learning, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know when people like to give. Christmas is an ideal time, maybe not Giving Tuesday, but they're very close on the calendar, yeah. yes. So the ask was too low, and the sense of urgency wasn't as important for donors. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Those are both great learning outcomes. Yes, Eli. I think that's a really excellent example. Um, and I've heard that before as well about anniversary campaigns. What's in it for the donor, right? Or when it's in it for the audience, why should they care that you're 
you know, turning, like David's turning 60 or whatever, right? All these things. <laughs> um, any others? Yes. So telling your audience about marketing costs wasn't something they cared about. Okay, great. Others, other learning outcomes for you. Yes, all the way in the back. Good learning. <laughs> yeah, so good learning outcome. The ask was too high, right? <laughs> so all of these things we learn. I, um, yeah, any others? One more, yes. Hey, um, for our holiday appeal, we had two different um, uh, donor groups. One was peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers um, from an event, and then the others were our um, donor base, which was super successful, and then the peer-to-peer the -peer fundraisers and the event participants was a complete flop. So really interesting, as you said, to look at, look at the data and, mm -hmm. and really tailor your ask to the audience. Yeah, that's yeah. a great example. Wonderful. I love hearing all of these. So these are all the reasons and more why I always encourage people to do what I call after action debriefs, where you look at an appeal or a communications campaign and think about what went well. What are we taking away from this? What are some learning outcomes we can bring into the next thing that we do? Maybe it was that the ask was too high. Maybe that there's really different segments of donors. Whatever that is for your group, it's important to think about that. Um, I'll share one of the ones that I came out of this past holiday season giving, uh, holiday giving season with. Um, one of the groups that I work with uh, down in San Francisco, they, um, we have a really interesting it's social enterprise model to their organization, um, but they work with youth and um, they specifically work with at-risk youth and helping them gain, an, uh, gain employment um, and then figuring out how to get them on paths into colleges and to pursue higher education. And so one of the things that we thought would really work <laughs> this year for messaging for them was this idea of tying into kind of holiday season giving and saying, um, asking donors to give the gift of, and then we used like different values of the organization. So we talked about giving the gift of opportunity. We talked about giving the gift of, um, uh, what did we talk about? Giving the gift of employment. We talked about giving the gift of education, all these things that the organization does. And I, in like past communications we've done with them, I was like, oh, I think this has like just the right amount of resonance because donors have talked about these things that they care about. I think it'll work, and it just didn't quite work quite as well as we thought it was going to. And in looking at those appeals and kind of taking some after action notes on them, I think one of the things that didn't work quite as well for us in those instances was that the ask wasn't as strong as we needed it to be. It was too watered down. Um, and I've seen this before, and I don't know why we didn't catch it in this instance, <laughs> but it was a case where I don't think that the ask was as compelling and connected to the message as it could have been. And so making sure there was that strong connection between those two things is one thing that we're definitely taking forward in that, ca in that campaign, for sure. Um, so all of this is to say data is your friend, which is something we're going to talk about a lot here today, right? Um, there are so many ways to learn from your data, to use your data to inform what you're doing, to inform your campaigns, and it doesn't just have to be about your donor database, which of course is a great source for data, but there's so many other ways to get data and to use that to inform your decision-making process. So I'd really encourage you to start thinking about what are those places you can start to use data and incorporate it into your decision-making process. All right, um, so I always tell people that I think connection comes from knowing your audience and knowing your donors. And for fundraisers, I always tell them part of your job is to know your donors. And I think if you're in major gifts, which some of you might be, that's really easy because you have highly personal relationships with donors. You're out meeting them face to face. You're out talking to them regularly. What's not as easy is if you're in an annual giving department with a donor file of something like, I don't know, 10,000 people, right? It's like, you're not gonna have individual conversations with every single one of those folks. Um, and it becomes difficult to feel like you can establish a connection to all of those people in your donor base. But I don't think it's impossible. And this is where the work really comes in in fundraising and communications is thinking about what can we do to establish a one-to-many connection where you're one person and you're over one organization. You're able to connect to lots of people through your messaging and through the stories that you tell. Um, and I always come back to this idea that how we connect is through data. We use the data to inform 
what we say. We use the data to look at what messages worked, what people liked, what they responded to, um, all of these things. And we can use that to kind of continuously inform our work, continuously inform the appeals and the stories that we write. There's lots of different data that we can look at, right? And I'll talk about some of those here in a few minutes. Um, but before we do that, one of the things I always encourage people to think about is what are the assumptions that you make about your audience and what are the actual facts that you know? And I always think this is a good question to consider because it's really easy to make assumptions, right, about the audience that you're communicating with. You're like, oh, I've been doing this for a couple of years. I know this, this, and this. And then sometimes I'll ask people and say, but do you actually have factual proof that those things are true? Have you tested this? Do you have the data to support that? And oftentimes the answer is no. And we end up working from these faulty assumptions about who we think it is we're communicating with. And so I think it's on the third question on the worksheet that asks you a little bit about what you know about your donor audience or your audience more generally. I'd love for you to write down some of those things that you know or think you know. And you could certainly put an asterisk next to the ones that you think are maybe assumptions if you want, <laughs> I'd encourage you to think about that. These are really good things to consider because all of this information starts to really roll into how we can make decisions and how we can start to really connect with that audience. What are some of the things that you know about your audience that you want to communicate with? Yes. What if they want to make a difference? They want to make a difference. OK. Great. What else? can be really simple things too. Yes. Because someone has wealth that they want to give to your organization. Ah. And that's not that's often an assumption, not yeah. a fact. So assumption is that so just because someone has wealth they want to give to your organization. How many of you have been in a board meeting where someone's like, "We should put the Lululemon founder on our major donor gift <laughs> list," right? <laughs> yeah. We've all been in those meetings. Yes. <laughs> that everybody will care because we work to help kids. Mm -hmm. And everybody cares about kids. Yeah. It's reality, right? I, I have worked really hard to overturn that assumption in, earlier in my fundraising career, which was that we do great work, everyone's going to love this, and everyone is going to want to donate. That assumption was one of the single big biggest hindrances to me as a writer in fundraising. Because by writing to everyone, I wrote to no one. And I couldn't ultimately connect to the people that really cared about what we were doing. Yes, other ones. Yeah. So making assumptions about how donors want to give short-term versus long-term investments in the organization. Yeah, any others from the side of the room? That's okay, these are great. And I hope you've written some down. Um, this is one of my favorite things to think about with a donor file or a donor base is to think about what are the things we know about them because they're really interesting people and just because there's a large volume of them does not mean that there's a, not a lot of commonality and seeking out the commonality is the key to figuring out how we can start to connect with more of them in a really effective, scalable way. Um, I'll tell you a story about data and connection and assumptions that... I feel served me well many years ago. <laughs> I was uh, managing a monthly giving program at the time, and one of my assumptions was that the monthly, the typical kind of monthly donor of this organization was the exact same profile or type of person as a single annual giving donor at the organization, who at that time was, I think, like a 65-year-old woman, most likely. And we had just sort of operated under that assumption for a long time. And when I started getting out and meeting some of these monthly donors face to face and talking to them on the phone, I was like, none of these people are anywhere close to 65. Like, why are we assuming this? And it was really funny because as I talked to them more and more and understood their motivations for giving, it was so different from the regular one-time donor. Our average monthly donor was somewhere around 42 years old. They were most likely married with at least one child. And they were often giving monthly because they wanted to include their children in giving and teach their children about philanthropy, which was such a radically different reason for giving. But it was so helpful to have identified that 
because it helped us to recognize how we could better connect with them. They wanted information to share with their kids. So we started creating shareable information that they could give to their families or have discussions about. We really radically rethought our events. We couldn't just have them be at night, at like a cocktail hour. They had to be family friendly because we wanted donors to bring their kids and feel like they could include their kids in philanthropy because that's what so many of them told us. So these were all good things that we learned in this process that ultimately helped us become smarter fundraisers and I think better connectors with that particular audience. All right. Yeah. I'm going to tell you. There's two ways. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I so part of it was just getting out and talking to people. I think um, sometimes the tendency with annual giving is that we just stay behind our desk and we send donors emails and letters and we don't really talk to them that often. Um, but I made it a point to talk to some of these monthly givers more often so they felt like they had a personal connection or someone they knew with the organization. Um, and so that was part of just what I did. I got out there and I met with people and talked to them and started to notice that they seemed in conversation very different than what we had assumed they were. And then we, in kind of a follow-up later on, sent out a survey where we really discovered what was going on. And I'm gonna talk about surveys as a tool for this. So let's talk a little bit more about data that informs stories and how we get some of this information. So I think about kind of two main ways that we can start to data gather and start to figure out who our audience is and how we can better connect with them through stories. So one is giving data, which is a, I think a really easy one, right? We look at people's um, giving history, what they gave to, um, what appeals resonated with them, how much they gave, what the giving levels fluctuated at, all of these things are great. And it's, I think, a really obvious way to start investigating this for your organization. Um, but I think the more interesting one, to me anyways, is looking at demographic and psychographic data. So in the field of philanthropy, one of the demographics that we often talk about that I think is useful, but maybe not as useful as other things, is generations, right? We talk about generational giving. So whether someone is a boomer or a Gen Xer or a millennial or... Um, I don't even know what the demographic is beneath millennials now, but whatever that one is called. <laughs> we talk about people in terms of generations sometimes in philanthropy, which is very useful, right? There's some real trends that emerge in different generations, whether it's how they choose, how they give, values that inform giving, um, their um, kind of broader generational values, things that they like, things that they don't like. That's all really useful. Um, and I think when we're talking very broadly about um, philanthropy and about our donor bases, this can be very useful to us. The one that I think is much more interesting is psychographic data, which I always liken to thinking about people's world beliefs, right? We want to think about what their political beliefs are, what their religious beliefs are, um, what their values are, um, what other sort of worldviews or belief systems they hold on to, and how that intersects with what you do and the philanthropy that they're, they're currently participating in. The reason I suggest this is, again, it goes back to this idea of uncovering values, uncovering real deep foundational motivations for people's connection to your organization. And I have found in so many instances of this, there's often a real through line in a donor base. Sometimes there'll be different segments, like there'll be two or three different groups. Um, of people who give for various reasons, but so often there almost always emerges a couple of clear ones where you're just like, oh, this is why people are giving. This is why they're coming to us. This is why they're excited to donate. And discovering what those are can be so incredibly powerful to be able to then connect with them and mirror that back to them in appeals and in communications. Um, do any of you keep track of data like this right now, demographics or psychographics? Yeah, I see a few heads nodding. What other kinds of pieces do you look at besides some of the ones that I mentioned? Any others? Well, we, do, uh, we have a couple of uh, like third-party fundraisers. We do the social thing. Oh, well, this is a moment I've been waiting for my whole <laughs> life. <laughs> I've never sang before, but I'm going to try. <laughs> Um, w w well, we learned a, uh, something just recently. We did a, um, a campaign before mm -hmm. Christmas, um, thanks to Fox and Holly. They're not here yet, but uh, our goal was five thousand dollars, and I think we were at forty-six. Mm -hmm. um, but at any rate, what we learned from that campaign is we have a couple of third-party or fundraisers that uh, 
like the Scotia Bank Charity Challenge. Yeah. So on that list was a number of donors who donate to the run. And I don't know if anyone else participates in that, but a lot of those donors aren't donating to us. They're, they're supporting the person that's running, who happens to be running for us. So a lot of people that received phone calls or those emails um, were unaware of who we were, really. So, you know, we learned that uh, we have to kind of, when we're sending the messages out, just make sure we're who we're sending them to. And um, it was a great, you know, opportunity to connect with them and let them know who we are. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Great example. Yeah, knowing where your donors came from and what motivated they're giving, especially I think third party fundraising sometimes can be a really good example of that. Um, what else? Other data points that you think about or things that you track? I understand that. So an instance where donors are overly connected to one person in the organization, um, and those relationships are not necessarily passed off to other people, right? And being able to get information is really challenging. I hear you on that. Is, your, is that person still at your organization? He's not working with us anymore. Okay. One of the things that I would recommend, sidebar from this, <laughs> is um, asking them to make personal introductions to someone at your organization and introduce you as a new contact for the organization and framing it as such so that they can kind of see that there's someone new that they can talk to who wants to talk to them and then going from there, that can often be helpful. If you haven't tried that yet. That okay. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's hard, right? And I think this is sometimes the challenge that we come up against is that we're so eager to know and learn about donors. And sometimes donors are very happy being at an arm's length distance. And that has to be okay, right? There will be people who regularly give and continue to give for many years, but just don't really want a relationship with the organization. And that's okay. It's frustrating, but it's kind of what happens sometimes, right? Um, that was a good example. I appreciate you sharing that. Any others um, of data that you're collecting or kind of things that you regularly look, look at? Yeah. Sorry, there's a, mic there's a microphone coming your way. Maybe you can say that again. Yeah, so it, I think it's really important to collect data on the process to becoming a donor. So what are the steps that somebody takes before you actually have the information on who they are as a donor? Right. So really important to track if you guys have websites, right? Understanding where is all that traffic coming from? Do people know who your brand is? Are they finding you through social media? Are they finding you through organic search? What does that look like? And then mapping out that journey so you can start to optimize that. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. Thank you for sharing that. All right, anything else? Okay, um, so with psychographics, I, as I said, I often am most interested in thinking about the values and the worldviews that brought someone into an organization. I just, I really always feel that that's ultimately what fuels people's philanthropy, and the more that I can understand that, the more I can effectively message something and think about how to best connect with that person, how to best communicate with them. And it's not, I would say, it's not super difficult to get this information. One of the ways that I do this is surveys, which we're going to talk about. Um, I always say surveys could be your magic bullet, but I don't think there's a magic bullet in fundraising. But it is a really good tool for you to use, so we're going to talk about it. Um, donor surveys. How many of you have run a donor survey in the last couple of years? Show of hands. A couple of you. Great. How have they gone? Have you got some useful information? Yeah? Okay. 
How else? Yes. Uh, we've never done this, mm -hmm. or at least for the 11 years I've been at the organization. What's the response, like average response, like percentage that you found? Um, it depends on if you do it through mail or email. Um, you could do it by phone too. Um, it, and also depends, I think, on what your current engagement rates look like with those things. Mm -hmm. um, I typically find for direct mail and email, it's usually anywhere from like five to 20%, although I'd say 20 yeah. is pretty high. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah. It also depends too, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, I always encourage people to never just send one email about a survey and that be it. I generally try to encourage them to send more than one email to people who have not yet responded so that you can increase that response rate. Anyways, we'll get to the logistics of surveys in a second. But um, donor surveys, I think, are one of the best tools for you to just directly get this information from donors if you're able to reach them and contact them. You can do this a variety of ways, as I said, um, mail, email, telephone is another option as well. Um, and I, when we've done surveys, we typically look at you know anywhere from five to 10 questions that we're asking donors. And before I go into figuring out what kinds of questions I'm going to ask and asking them everything under the sun, I like to think about what is my objective for this survey? What am I trying to learn? And generally, there's something that you want to learn. You know, for I, I always think a good starting point is sometimes just understanding why people are giving to your organization. That's often a really good objective. Um, other ones I've worked on have been to just learn a little bit more about the demographic composition of a donor base. Um, we've also looked at things like what specific programs are people responding to? Is there something about our work and the programmatic side of it that people are really into that's really resonating with them? There's lots of different things you could think about. I always think the why are people really donating to us is a good one to start with. And once we define an objective for a survey, what we then do is think about what kinds of questions can we ask that will get us to this objective? What would be useful information for us to know? A really great question that I often will ask is why, what prompted your last gift to the organization? And to learn a little bit more about what it was that made people give. And oftentimes that will tell me, you know, was it, you know, something in the news or something larger that prompted that gift? Was it an appeal that they liked? Um, was it something that was happening in their personal life? You know, there's a whole gamut of reasons, right? But knowing what that is can be really helpful. I will also ask really open-ended questions where people can just tell me in their own words what it, why it was they donated. And one of the things that I'll do when we go back and look at a survey, or survey results is start to really look qualitatively at people's answers and say, are there recurring words or phrases <laughs> that are coming up in these answers that people are using to describe us or to talk about the work or to talk about why they're donating? And if there are, I generally think that those recurring answers start to become a through line of really useful information that we can then use, language that we can use in messaging and stories in how we talk about the organization that becomes the donor's language that they actually would use themselves, that they would actually talk about. And that's really exciting. Um, other things I can tell you about surveys. There's so many. I'm sure some of you probably have questions, though. <laughs> um, I will also usually, um, with surveys, think about timing it so that we can, as I said, send more than one um, or do some sort of follow-up. Um, creative things I've done in the past to increase direct mail survey responses have included doing thank you phone calls like a week or two before we drop a survey in the mail and telling people during the thank you phone call, we're sending you a survey and we'd love for you to fill it out. So when you see it, fill it out and send it back to us. Um, that's often one thing that I've done. Um, we've also done follow-up calls to donors who've been non-responders and just done the survey on the phone with them. So there's lots of things you can do to gather this data and get this information. I always say to people, it's not so important that you know the specific person, the name of the specific person who responded. You don't necessarily need to put that information in your database with their donor record. You could if you wanted to. But it's more interesting to look at the group as a whole. What are the trends that you're seeing? What are the kind of through lines that are emerging? What's the general consensus of how people are feeling about the organization, what they're responding to? Because that's going to be more useful than any kind of specific granular result. So there's just some things I would think about. Other questions, things that are top of mind for you on surveys? Yes. Oh, there's a microphone coming your way. We were actually just thinking about doing a survey. Do you recommend getting a professional survey organization to survey your members, or do you do it yourself? We haven't had a lot of luck just doing it ourselves. 
um, in terms of getting a good response to it. You could try working with a professional surveying company. I've had a few groups who have done that before. Um, it would certainly cost you a lot more to work with a professional firm, right? <laughs> um, if there's some other method that you haven't yet tried for serving, I'd maybe consider trying that first just to see if you can get a better response rate or maybe taking more of like a multi-pronged approach to it. That might also help as well. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Um, I was just wondering if you have a large database, are you segmenting off, you know, you're saying about the like long form answers can take a lot of time to go through. Mm -hmm. Are you doing like a cross section or doing your whole database? Like what's the best way to do it? What's your database size, if you don't mind me asking? Um, good question. I'm not sure, but it's in the thousands. So would definitely like take Tens of thousands or under 10,000? Uh, under 10,000. Under 10,000, okay. Um, that's probably going to be a very manageable size given the response rate. Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't necessarily, and I've, it's also not a large enough audience that I think the segments will be super significant and large. I would just segment the group as, or survey the group as a whole <laughs> right. um, and do you. that that way. Yeah. Perfect. Yes. Sure, so if someone tied their name to a survey response, like how you would keep that data, yeah, you could definitely put it in a notes um, piece. I'm trying to think in. You could create a tag. There we go. <laughs> um, I would say probably notes would be the thing that I would do. Um, and I would say there's probably also a way to tag the person as having received or responded to a survey, so you can then pull a query based on survey respondents to see specific answers. Um, but that's what I would do for that. Yeah. Yes. So I always limit the surveys to like five minutes, or I call them five minute surveys because I'm worried that people will drop off. Do, is there an advantage to maybe doing like a longer form? Like, sort of what's the, the risk benefit of a longer survey versus a, a short one? Well, I think the risk is definitely that people are not going to answer it, right? Because it just becomes too long and too cumbersome. I recently received a survey from an organization that I'm a monthly donor to, and it's a very large national group in the US. Um, and it was, I kid you not, a 55 question survey. <laughs> it took me a very long time to go through, but because I'm such a nerd, I wanted to screenshot all of the questions and see them all. So I went through the whole thing. Um, but the thing that I thought was really interesting about their survey, and I know people who work there, so I've been meaning to ask them about the response rates that they got to this, um, was that they really keyed in on questions of asking donors about their understanding of this larger political issue that the organization was um, advocating for um, and trying to understand what it was donors knew about it in relationship to the organization so that they could then construct educational um, communications that would kind of move people's knowledge down the field. So they were really detail-oriented questions. I was pretty surprised by it, just by the length. Um, so the, the definitely the downside would be drop-off. The advantage would be that you would get more information potentially if you ran a longer survey, right? Yeah. So I'm kind of wave, right? All right, I want to keep going because I know we are coming up to time for questions and answers. Um, I would love for you to think about what are two questions that you could ask people in a survey. There are so many questions out there that you could ask them, whether it's about why they give, um, you know, what brought them to your organization, what their age is, um, what their geographic location is, if you for some reason don't have that. So many different questions you could ask. Um, I'll tell you, one of the other ones that I really like to ask is, um, asking people to tell me in one sentence what the organization does, which I like to ask more as a communications question more than a fundraising based question, um, because I want to know how effective have my communications been to that audience? Do they really understand what it is we do? And when I look at dozens or maybe hundreds of responses to a survey, um, are there some common threads? Are people c consistently describing this organization back to me in a way that I want to hear it? And that can really be a strategic move on your part to then think about, well, if this is what people are telling me, but this is what I really want them to know, how can I kind of move the boat more <laughs> in that direction? How can I get people thinking more along these lines um, and get them you know, up to speed or just changing their opinion on your organization? 
all things you can think about. All right, so let's talk about data insight into action. So just as we kind of come to the end here. So as you get your survey responses and start to think about this information or however you like to gather your data, um, one of the things that I always think about is starting to develop key messages based on what people have told me. So how can I start to better communicate with people? Um, what is it that they like about our organization? What values resonate with them? How can I turn those into compelling statements or messages about what we do, why people should give, and why people should be a part of this really awesome organization? Those are the things that I always think about. So messaging development is, is really helpful, but we can also think about how can this data inform stories that we tell. So let's say you are, let's think of an example. Um, you're a social service organization <laughs> working with kids, and you have a variety of different programs that you run. And let's say maybe one of your programs is some sort of summer camp program. Um, one of the things that you could look at in your data, let's say people said of the like five programs you run, camp is the one that they're most interested in. One of the things I would think about as a writer and as a communicator is then telling more stories about camp because I know people like them and I know it's something that they'll pay attention to, which is great. And I can use that as a springboard for other types of communication and other messages that I want to get across to them. So that's one way that you can think about that. There's lots of other things that you can do with this data. You could also think about using it to inform you know, gift levels that you ask for. You could use it to inform calls to action that you create for your fundraising. So many different things. I'm going to give you a couple of other examples of what you can do with it. Um, one of the things I always encourage people to think about is actually creating an audience profile. So thinking about who is this typical person that gives to my organization, or who is this typical person who is in the social media sphere of influence for our organization. Um, who is that person? What sort of demographic and psychographic details do I know about them? And can I create just a one page that summarizes that typical person to help me use that as a decision-making tool and as you know something that can inform my writing and content that I might create in those different places. That's something really helpful. One of the things that I um, often get organizations to do when they create a profile is then to use it after they've written an appeal and ask themselves, does our profile like this appeal? <laughs> Based on the things that we know about them, is this something they're likely to respond to? You're certainly not going to get 100% certainty because there's always erratic, unpredictable behavior, right? But it can help you better filter your decision-making process and continue to make better decisions. Um, and then the last thing I would just say, too, is just always be testing and always be data gathering. Um, to me, this is one of the most important things that I always encourage people to do, is to constantly be gathering information. Um, think about what else can I learn? What else would I like to learn? And just be passionately curious about this audience that you have. There's so much to learn about them and so much to gain from learning that information. So I'd encourage you to continue to just be curious, be a learner, and keep collecting that information to use at your organization and to use that to inform the stories you tell, the messages that you create, um, and ultimately the fundraising appeals that you put out there. All right, so with that, I think we're gonna go to Q&A and do some questions. So if you have questions about things I've talked about or maybe things I haven't talked about, this would be a great time to ask those. And I think microphones will be coming around. Again, yes. You Got said you, uh, you're you a monthly donor of two organizations. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's any more, but I'd be curious if you'd be willing to donate to ours. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the bravado in asking me. <laughs> we've, just, we've just moved over to a new database system. I'd really like to try it out. It's really user inter <laughs> It's got a really nice user interface. You go to campcurry.org slash donate. Try it out and get back to us. All right. I will check it out. Thank you. <laughs> And Kila. We use Kila now. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, thanks so much for all of your insights. Um, so I'm ED of an extremely small, very new charity. And um, to my knowledge, we're the only charity, registered charity with the CRA in Canada advocating for the replacement of animals in science because the CRA will not register you as a charity if you're an anti-vivisection organization. So when it comes to things on our social media that potential donors and our supporters to date resonate with, it's terms like animal cruelty and stop researching on animals in labs and that kind of stuff. Yeah. But 
that might put us in conflict with our charitable activities that are approved by CRA. So, um, and the other tension is that we've agreed as an organization not to share graphic content and so um, in terms of animal suffering. And so um, I'm wondering if you have any advice on, um, there are certain things that I know resonate with our audience already, but we don't want to do for good reason. And if you have any um, advice on navigating that a little bit. And if sure. anyone else is in that position, that would be great to speak to you too. Yeah. Um, so on the first question about the legality of talking about the work or talking about it too much to jeopardize a CRA designation, I am not a lawyer. I would encourage you to probably talk to a lawyer about that who specializes in charitable law. Um, there are many of them, and I think they would have a much better legally appropriate answer than I will. <laughs> um, that being said, though, you know, I think it, what is it like? It has to be less than 10% of your total work. Um, I think there is, to me, there's a very, very real difference between the content that you're producing to talk about the work versus the actual work that you're doing. Um, and I don't know if there's a gray area where it's like if you spent 50% of your content time talking about this 10%, if that would mean that you're somehow violating that. I don't know. That would be something to investigate with a legal professional. Um, the second question you had, so you mentioned um, you know what people like, but you're not sure that's what you want to share, right? Yeah. Okay. You could tell people. I would also say you could just pursue your plan of action and see what happens, right? Like, I would be curious to know if in three or six months' time, which is generally a good amount of time to evaluate something, um, are you seeing a dip in response rates or are you seeing a dip in engagement on social media channels that you used to have a very high engagement rate on um, because you've changed the type of content that you're sharing? So I would look for actual donor behavior or audience behavior evidence um, of those things. So I would probably try it and just see how those numbers stack up to what you had seen previously. Ultimately, it's your organization. You can make the choices that you want. Um, you know, I've worked with many organizations over the years who will talk about things in a certain way that makes them feel comfortable. They will or won't tell certain stories. All of those things are completely fine. And I would say you don't have to justify yourself if you don't want to. But you can also be transparent and tell donors the story or the rationale behind something. I think that's also appropriate. Yeah, yes. There's a microphone coming your way. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if you can give some advice to those of us who um, work in fields in the nonprofit world where um, we're working on foundational long-term benefits. Mm -hmm. um, I work for an organization that focuses on educating the heart. Mm -hmm. And so it's not the same type of appeal that you can make saying, you know, we fed 150 children a warm breakfast. Sure. Um, you can't just say, check off a box, 150 hearts educated. Mm -hmm. So can you give some advice to um, different approaches for those of us who are really investing in long-term solutions and foundational work as opposed to things that can be easily uh, tangible and, and checked off? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm going to go back to something I said earlier, which is knowing your audience is a really big key piece of this. Um, and many organizations have the benefit of being able to understand very clearly who their audience is for something they're fundraising for, and that will inform the type of ask that they make. And maybe it will be really tangible, like give us $150, we'll feed this many people, or whatever that is. Um, but you can ask your donors and say, how would you like us to ask? What could we say that would be compelling to you? How do you like to talk about this? There's lots of things that you could do. I would spend more time doing research with those groups of people. Um, and probably, I think in that instance, one of the things I would do is probably have a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations with people and take copious notes <laughs> and just talk to them about their interest in your organization, why they've ga given in the past, um, and what you can do to keep them interested, um, and just think about those things. I think that will be a much better foundation um, than probably anything else you could do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Um, how would you approach uh, an organization that has a history of being very protective of their donors and doesn't want to send more than one email a month, <laughs> doesn't want to survey them, and is hesitant about reaching out to them uh, too often? Hmm. Good question. Um, I feel like there's lots of things I would say to that. <laughs> um, I mean, the, the bottom line is that people give to you because they like you, right? And they want to hear from you. Um, I always think about research that Penelope Burke has done in the field on donors and fundraising over the years. She has a wonderful book, Donor-Centered Fundraising, if you've never read it. Um, she talks about donor retention really hinging on two key things. One, donors understanding their impact and how their gift was used and two, feeling thanked and appreciated, right? They wanna know how it was used and feel thanked for that gift. Um, and in order to accomplish those things and be able to retain people long-term in our donor base, we have to communicate with them on some level. And sometimes a thank you note or just a you know kind of re tax receipt is not enough. There has to be other touch points. Um, and I would also say too, thinking about fundraising more conceptually, so much of what we're doing is relationship building. And in order to have a relationship with someone, you have to be in contact with them, right? You can't just be kind of absent for many months from a friendship. Well, some of you probably could. <laughs> but if you didn't talk to someone that was sort of an acquaintance of yours for let's say like a year or two years maybe, and then just suddenly you popped up out of nowhere and wanted to stay at their house for a month, you know, it would be a little odd, right? You'd be like, well, I don't know what to say to that. Um, and it's kind of like that with donors as well, right? We have to be in communication with them. Um, and ha figuring out what those touch points are is a really important piece of that. And I think someone else is going to talk about that later today. But I would encourage you to think about, or the organization to think about, the relationship building process. You know, you're not bothering or bugging donors. If you are, they're going to tell you, and it's probably not going to be that many. And if it's one, you can't change the course of action just based on what one person has said. Um, but it's really important to be out there building those relationships with people and, you know, making more time and space for those communications, I think is a big piece of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Just related to that question too, have you noticed that there are intergenerational differences with a desire to engage with an organization or to engage over certain mediums? So even with emails, I know we have um, a lot of older generations and so they are less likely to maybe receive emails well from what we've received um, as feedback. So can you speak to that at all? Have you noticed differences intergenerationally or would you say it's pretty straight across the board? I mean, I've certainly noticed them. I feel like I notice more differences from organization to organization because I think organizations, donor compositions are different and also donor behavior can sometimes be very different from organization to organization. Um, Part of it really depends on how you have trained your donors, right? If they are used to hearing from you in a certain way, that's how they're going to respond, um, and that's what they've just come to expect. Um, and if you radically change course, you know, there's a learning curve and an adaptation kind of curve where people get used to that method or that medium. Um, I would say there's certainly things that you could say about all the different generations. You know, I would say people over 65 are, you know, they're using email, but that may not be their primary form of communication with your organization. Um, I was very surprised years ago working in major gifts to find that I had a handful of donors who really appreciated text messages instead of my phone calls, and we communicated by text, and they were totally fine with that. Um, it really will depend on the donor, um, and it will depend on how you've kind of set expectations around that. Um, is there a demographic you're specifically thinking about with your group? Yeah, likely over the age of 65 or 70, so, yeah. Yeah, I would probably say the phone would be the way I would communicate with them <laughs> most often, especially for, for like, stewardship, um, and probably direct mail would be the other one I'd be looking at. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I just have a question around uh, your thoughts on in terms of doing a survey, the question around what would make you give more? Mm -hmm. Like, what would like is that a good question to yeah, ask? Yeah, exactly. Is there a yeah. Do you think that, that there would be some receptivity to that? Um, there could be. Have you ever been through like a feasibility study process before for a capital campaign? No, okay. So, so for those of you who have not been through a feasibility study for a, like a large capital campaign, part of what you often do in that is you're going out and asking people, would you be willing to give me a million dollars or would you be willing to give in this gift bracket? Um, and you're going out and assessing people's capacity and assessing inclination as a big part of that. Um, I feel like it's totally okay to say to someone or to ask a question of, you know, we know you've been giving at this level for 
X number of years, whatever. That might be a little too creepy to be that specific. But you could say, we know you've been a donor to us for a while. And we would love to know, you know, what would make you increase your donation? And there will be, you know, you could do a checkbox kind of answer for people. There could be some people who would just be like, we're tapped out at our financial capacity. And that happens, right? And that's totally fine. Uh, but there might also be other people who are just like, well, I don't know what other opportunities there are. No one's presented me with something compelling. No one's contacted me or had the conversation about other opportunities. Um, so that might bring to light some real changes that you could make to your strategy, whether it's with major gifts or annual giving um, and being able to start to kind of amend your donor relations strategy to be able to get to some of those folks. Yeah. Are you nervous about asking that question? No, I don't. I just want to make sure. Yeah. I think so. Um, when I work on um, communications audits for groups and we do audience research um, into donor or other audiences that an organization has, um, one of the questions that I will sometimes ask related to communications will be, what would make you want to share this with your best friend? And I like whether it's a specific communication or I'll, I'll give them an example usually. Um, and I always get great responses to that question, which are usually very telling about the gaps in our communication strategy um, and what we need to do to make things more compelling and more shareable or interesting for people to feel like, oh yeah, I totally want to forward that email to my friend or I want to message this to someone on Facebook, whatever it is. Asking questions like that, people will often give you very good um, qualitative answers. Um, so using, so kind of asking people to volunteer and then become a donor? Uh, so they're, currently they're currently volunteering. Hmm. Um, I have not had a ton of experience with volunteers. My limited experience has told me that people often think that their time volunteering is their donation. And so they don't, some will feel offended that you've asked for money. Others will just be like, oh, that's not how I want to donate or give back. You could ask a few volunteers at your organization and say, we were thinking about sending an appeal. How would you feel if this showed up in your inbox <laughs> or in your mailbox? That might also be a good option. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, how are we doing on time? Just about? Oh, we're just about out of time. Um, I will be around all day, so feel free to ask me questions. Um, I will also say, um, this is my email address. I always tell people to email me anytime if you have questions, um, want to stay in touch. Um, Vanessa at the Storytelling Nonprofit is my email address. And as I said, I'll be floating around, so feel free to come say hi, and we can talk about what's happening at your organization. Thank you so much, everyone.